Okay, so this is the uh, Finance Claim and Audit Committee. Uh, today is uh, June 4th, 2018. Uh, so we've got three items on the agenda. So the uh, first one is the tax budget for 2019. Uh, the second one we're going to talk about um, just city finances in general. And then the third one, uh, we will discuss claims that have been filed against, or been, people have filed claims to get reimbursed for things they believe the city owes them for. So I'll give an update on that. Um, so the first one, we'll kind of talk about this tax budget. So uh, this is actually a super, and I think I mentioned this council meeting, it's a pretty super great year to be on finance committee when it comes to the tax budget portion because we have a plan that we've already laid out and that council's approved. And so the tax budget that we have here, it's also on the auditor's website at norwoodauditor.com. Uh, uh, the tax budget that's, that's here is basically just identical to the um, what's in the fiscal recovery plan. So um, we'll kind of flip through it here and uh, kind of talk about some specific things. Uh, the first page, just uh, ske the Schedule A, I think it just talks about um, some of the millage that for property tax levies I and mean, all of that's just the same. Um, and it, the thing is, this is a form that is used by every municipality in the county, and it might even be something that's used by every municipality in the state, I'm not sure, but definitely in the county. So there's certain things that will be on here that won't apply to Norwood, and so uh, most of the time those things will just be blank. Uh, and just two for the record, so the auditor uh, very much wanted to be here to present uh, the tax budget, but um, you know, I really made sure to try to prioritize the committee member schedule, so uh, this was the best time for us to meet. The auditor is going to be at our council meeting on the 12th, or uh, yes, it should be June 12th, and he'll be discussing so well, there'll be a public hearing. Um, at if we have any questions or if we feel like that we want to meet before like meet again to try to make sure Jim is here to uh, discuss it with us uh, before that the meeting on the 12th then you know we can't really discuss via email but just let me know that you want to meet and we'll be happy to I think I think our schedules might align before that council meeting so we can always meet then and have a discussion with them Okay, uh, so page three is about revenues. So basically it shows the uh, revenues that we got in 2016, 2017, the current year estimated for 2018, and then what we're estimating for 2019. And the, 20, the 2019 estimates, again, they're all based on what we have, um, what we have in the fiscal recovery plan. Now there will be some specific changes in here uh, that you may not see. So if you go line by line in the recovery plan, you're not going to see it. There's going to be a couple things that will be different. Uh, in our fiscal recovery plan, we have a section at the very end that's called recovery plan items, and so those are things that we've you know estimated that we are you know we projected and said that hey we're going to do these things, but we call them out separately because we want to know like what are these action items that we're going to be working on. Well, because we're saying we already know that we're going to do them, we're saying that we're going to do them. Uh, there's there's not a separate fiscal recovery plan section in our tax budget. So in the tax budget, all those will all be accounted for. So we add um, street personnel into the general fund. And so those will be accounted for in the tax budget in at the street uh, department, whereas in our fiscal recovery plan, they're at the very end of the recovery plan items. The uh, other difference is how we do um, income tax. And so uh, traditionally, I think the, audit, the, the tax budget has always had our um, earnings tax numbers after any agreements that we have specifically with companies, uh, after we pay those out. In our fiscal recovery plan, uh, our earnings tax numbers are gross numbers. They're the numbers before we take out the, the items that we've, we're contractually obligated to pay. So with just the, I guess we have four companies that we have agreements with, Paycor, CDK Global, uh, I Square Foot, which is now Construct Connect, and then very soon Tri Health will be moving in um, over at the old ITT Tech building. And so, uh, in the fiscal recovery plan, we're saying we're putting those in the revenue, and then at the very end of it, we're taking them out. Whereas in the tax budget, we're not including them in the general fund at all, So because they never actually touch the general fund. So uh, the tax budget, frankly, is th this is the better way to account for it. Uh, however, this, you know, the auditors of state in the fiscal recovery plan 
want to make you know they want to keep it the way that it is for the reason so there's no conflict there in the sense that it's it's fine there are two different budgets but it's just if you were to look back at the numbers then you'll see that difference so i just wanted to make sure we call that out so yeah it shows the revenues here it shows our projected revenues and again um, the auditor just pulled them straight from our fiscal recovery plan uh, page four shows our expenditures uh, so let's see here and it has them kind of just by line by specific grouping there uh, the total, so just so people at home know, so for our total expenditures, um, in 2018, we're estimating that we'll have $22,268,000 that we'll be spending. In 2019, that number will drop to $21,815,000. And so part of that is because we had some one-time items that we were able to pay off in uh, 2018 uh, to allow us to, you um, yeah, I guess be able to take advantage of not having interest rates and stuff accumulating on some of the debts that we owe. James, yeah. is that also reflective of some of the better deals we've gotten, such as like with the copiers and wasn't that renegoti renegotiated at a lower level as well? So yeah. our expenses would have gone down for that as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I do not believe that the fiscal recovery plan includes the coffee. I, I can't remember the timing. It, it might. I'm not sure if it includes that or not, but I think that is too. I think there was some savings that we've gotten, so. Okay. Uh, yep. And then for the revenue, um, it's projected that this year we'll have $22,168,000 in our current year estimate. In 2019, that goes down to $21,867,000. Okay. Uh, so the... Uh, the next page is just, I mean, some general things we don't, that doesn't really apply to us, that page six. Page seven actually details the full, um, every single fund that I guess that we have and kind of uh, the estimated uh, fund balance that's not encumbered, the amount that we're expecting to receive, the amount that we're expecting to spend. Uh, and then it just talks about, uh, it classifies where we're spending money in each of those funds, whether it's personal services or other. And so, um, basically here, we always, we just project whatever the fund balance is, we just project that we're gonna, I mean, you'll see that estimated unencumbered balance, if they're all at zero. They're not gonna be at zero at the end of that year, but that's just the way that it gets submitted to the uh, auditor's office, the auditor, the county auditor's office. Well, there's some different bond uh, type things on the next page, page eight. Uh, you know, it just kind of helps to clarify where the city owes money, and most of these are just TIF bonds, so they're bonds that are getting paid back through uh, tax increment financing kind of districts. And once we pay, so and if the, let's just say those districts don't bring in enough money to pay those back, then the property owner is on the hook for any shortfall. So none of these obligations that are here are ever going to come back to the city of Norwood. The property owners are are on the hook for them. Okay, uh, so we don't uh, use the next two pages. We don't have any judgments against us. Uh, so, um, actually, um, I want to correct something. So, on the page that we had just looked at, it's really that's really about the funds that we are paying bonds off. The actual bonds are on this uh, exhibit six. So it's two page, uh, three pages there. So they talk about the purpose of bonds and notes is the title of it. That is the one where it actually has like the interest rates that we're paying, how much we currently owe, and how much we're gonna pay um, this year, or I guess in 2019. That's the 324,000? Uh, that is. Or, or you're saying the total is listed here. These are all bonds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, okay, yeah. I see. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and they're all characters. Okay. Okay, and that's basically the the report there. I'm not sure what some of the other pages are. Yeah, that's basically the tax budget. So 
Um, we're not necessarily from this committee going to make any recommendations tonight like oh yeah we want to present this to council it's going to get presented to council just because the auditor presents it uh, but if we did uh, want to you know we definitely need to look at this further because it just got published a couple of days ago um, if we had any like said specific questions we're I'm very happy to try to find a time to organize so that we can meet again and it'll, it'll probably be um, the Tuesday before the council meeting uh, we can also ask those count you know, these questions at council so when Jim is here at the council meeting and then uh, it doesn't have to be approved until the end of June so we don't have to approve the tax budget at the meeting on the 12th we have we'll have time to uh, if we do decide that we want to take more time we'll have time to do that so it's just kind of up to whatever council's will is at the time or if there's specific members that want to have more time to digest it after hearing from Jim. Additional comments or questions on the tax bill? I'll yeah. make sure I prep my questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, just to remind people at home, the tax budget is on norwoodauditor.com. And uh, I know Jim, his email address is there, or the auditor's email address is on there. I know he's always uh, willing to answer questions from the citizens if they have that as well. Okay, so the next topic is city finances. I went ahead and printed out a, or a Kelly Brown from the auditor's office did, but it's the statement of cash position report uh, with month to date. So it's the two page report uh, yeah, that you have there. Uh, so just kind of looking at, uh, this report shows basically the balances in each fund. So we've got you know, 70 or so, 60 or 70 different funds. Um, and it'll show, we talk, basically see the receipts, the disbursements of, from that month, and the unexpended balance. So uh, there's a couple of things I just wanted to highlight here. So the general fund, uh, this is the first month that we've had it uh, where the general fund is, does not have a negative balance. So the unexpended balance in the general fund is $65,000, which is a big positive. Now, we have to caveat that because we have outstanding encumbrances of $1.7 million. So, you know, the ending balance, if you count the encumbrances, things that we project that we're going to spend by the end of the year, you know, it's it's $1.6 million. However, the fact that our unexpended balance is in the positive is a uh, very good thing. So, uh, a lot of times, though, that will edge up and down. So, as we go throughout the, the year, some months we'll get more tax revenue in. So, we might get a whole bunch of building department revenue one month, or we might get uh, earnings tax revenue, might have a, 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 a solid month. Or we could get our property taxes in at a certain time. So, mm -hmm. that number's going to go up and down. I actually I don't expect it to stay in the positive, you know, as we move forward, but it's just something that uh, to note. Uh, the next one that I really uh, we should definitely note is the water fund. So the water fund has a negative hundred and sixty-six thousand dollar unexpended balance, and so that's a lot more positive than it was. I mean, uh, two months ago we were at around four hundred thousand dollars unexpended, but um, it's still in the negative. And so uh, one of the things that we had talked about at our last meeting is potentially getting a backfill uh, using the water fund, and so at the time we said. Uh, no, we, let's just hold off on the backhoe because we don't want to push that fund further in. Um, I did talk to the safety service director today and the, the need is very much still there. Uh, they're getting by right now, but just the, the backhoe they have, really, it's falling apart. I mean, it's really old. They're doing the best they can to maintain it. So, you know, he just, he recommended that we definitely will need to do it uh, before the end of the year. We'll need to get the backhoe because especially when we start having water main breaks, uh, we have to have something that we can rely on because if let's just say that uh, you know when we do have a water main break, we have to turn off the water you know for maybe a couple blocks of houses. So we want to get that fixed as as quickly as possible. And so if we have a backhoe that breaks in the middle of that fix or that we can't do it, and we, we're waiting 10, 12 hours, maybe a day to to get a replacement backhoe in there, then it's going to cause issues, cause issues for residents, and you know just cause issues for the. The water department so we will have to make that purchase at some point uh this year but thankfully like i said the water fund is on the right path so um that is a good thing 
Uh, but every other fund, the unexpended balance is positive. So, uh, which is where we're you know looking to be. Uh, the police chief in Fund 11 had reached out, or Fund 11 or Fund 12, both of them were his um, drug funds. He had reached out and talked about um, that he's got a balance that is higher than the appropriations for that fund. So this just states, this doesn't have anything to do with appropriations. This the document we're looking at just talks about uh, the fund balance, cash balances. So uh, I'm gonna talk to Jim and we'll look at potentially uh, doing a appropriations change to allow him to use some of the extra cash that is in that fund. Those were just um, leftover funds from but will we get drug fund money throughout the year at various times? I don't know what the intervals are, but we have to, us as council has to appropriate dollars mm -hmm. to allow them to spend the money that's in there. So we have not appropriated dollars that match, you know, that match what I see. Yep, the balances are. So there's no, there's no way to control for how much comes in. So we need to adjust yeah. the appropriation so they can access whatever has come in. Exactly. Okay. And that's for 11 and 12? 11 and 12, yes. What, what is DAG? I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's something to do with their drug. It's okay. We'll find out. I'll add that to the question. Yes. List. Yes. So um, now, just saying too. So we don't necessarily. It doesn't have to. Like our appropriations don't have to match what the cash balance is. So let's just say that. I mean, that the funds are chosen. The way they are spent is chosen by the police chief, and then it's approved by the safety service director but it's still city money. So if we decided at one point that we'd like to see that fund for whatever reason, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that fund that's restricted on how we spend it. So, you know, I'm not proposing that we do anything, but just know too as council that we don't have to appropriate fully to whatever's in that fund balance. I mean, if we just, if there's a reason why we wouldn't want to, then uh, we should definitely just, you know, take that into account when we're thinking about these. Okay. And so this is not, not so this is not the official month end report. So the month end uh, the month end report will be closed tomorrow. I mean, there probably won't be very many changes. Probably a few things, but Kelly, like I said, Kelly Brown uh, printed it out for us now. I'll uh, we'll probably be getting it in our email tomorrow. So you might just want to check that out and scan that again to see if there's anything that you have questions on. Okay, uh, before we get to uh, Assistant Chief McCabe, I just want to give a quick update on the law departments. Uh, I guess the, the claims to the city. So basically, and I know you all seen these, we've heard about these, but basically there's a process where people that feel like the city owes them money for something, let's just say they, they hit a massive pothole that the city should, you know, should have known about and should have you know, had sufficient time to fix. You know, they can come to the law department or come to the city and say, fill out a form saying, hey, here's my documentation. I would like the city to you know, pay this out. And so it's basically a process that allows us to deal with things that might need to be dealt with before they go into a court, like basically into a courtroom. And so, you know, not everything that's going to get filed, that people file, we're going to want to take, you know, action on to pay that out. I'd say a lot of times it's probably, probably don't want to take a lot of action. But uh, us as elected officials are not experts though on what we should pay or shouldn't pay. Like I, we don't know the you know, past case history, like what are the chances that, uh, you know, it, one, are we even potentially liable? Two, um, you know, is the value, you know, the value of what they're trying to say is that match up with what uh, we should be paying out. There's just a lot of dynamics and there's a lot of facts behind each claim that we as like elected officials, it, it's not really our job to individually go in and try to investigate all of this. So uh, basically I've talked to the law, our assistant law director, uh, Mr. Gary, and he is, him and I are gonna sit down this Friday and we're gonna review each of these and try to get like a law department recommendation. And so and put some com he'll put some comments in there too. And so the comments that he's going to put together are going to be um, privileged comments. They're going to be, they'll be confidential because they'll be uh, basically uh, informing counsel on actions that we could, actions that could be a potential legal matter. So uh, we'll have those for the finance committee before we meet the next one, give you all sufficient time to review that. Uh, let's just say that we did find one that we wanted to pay out. Uh, in our fiscal recovery plan, we don't allocate any funds for settlement of claims. And so um, if we do decide that we would want to pay something out, we would need to adjust the fiscal recovery plan to do that. 
Now we already do have some plans to do that. There's some changes that might be happening at the next council meeting, so uh, that could affect uh, the you know financial position of the city, you know, going forward over the five years. And so just with some of the retirement health care and C9 trust and trying to eliminate costs that we currently send to Innovations, who doesn't do a great job of managing um, these different programs for us. And so once we, if we do pass the changes, then we probably will make some changes in our fiscal recovery plan at some point. And so at that point we would, and there's some other changes, like we need to adjust some things in the street fund as well, because we need some materi additional materials to allow us to preserve the streets better. And we were very conservative in our street fund and said that, hey, we want to preserve as much money as possible until we get a plan together. Well, um, we do. We will still need to spend some money to make sure that we're preserving what we have out of the plans getting uh, together. So we'll need that change. We'll need the retirement health care change. And then we'll probably, if there is anything, we'll change it at that point, the settlement of claims. So I expect us to do that in August or September. I would think that we would make that change. So I would have a couple readings at council and and then the Fiscal Recovery Commission, of course, would have to approve any changes that we make uh, to the Fiscal Recovery Plan. Uh, so, yep, some more to come there. So we'll go back to kind of city finances. Um, One quick question before yeah, we go back. Uh, just a point of clarity, make sure I'm following along. So we do know there are some claims that we'll get a recommendation on from the law department and should we decide to take action we're anticipating when we make other changes to the fiscal recovery plan we put money in the budget at that time to settle the claims correct okay and your goal is to have some recommendations out to council later this week early next week yes and then well it'll be actually uh, the recommendations probably won't be ready until mid next week so okay so sometime in june recommendations and then august september is when you're anticipating well we'll want to make we'll want to take action on those beforehand because we'll want to know like what council's decided before we start crafting the fiscal recovery plan so it'll be good to i would say by the end of july it would be nice to for the finance com the finance committee and then council as well to have a good idea of where we want to go with do we need to make the changes first before we move as a body to act in a certain way well it's more the fact that what does this body want to actually make the changes? Like, do we want to? Okay, so it's a vote to make the changes and then actual making changes. Yes, yes, because we'll okay. want to make sure that the number that we put in the first settlement claims is as, is as exact as possible. I mean, we don't really want any spare dollars hanging around there. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, uh, so Assistant Chief McCabe is here. Uh, he wrote the Finance Committee a letter. Uh, basically informing us of some opportunities with uh, some grant money and also just talking about some of the needs of the fire department. Uh, do you want to read your letter? I mean, or basically just want to give us a quick a summary of it, like of what, of what you need from us at this point or what, and if you wouldn't mind just coming to the microphone for the people at home. I know your voice can project, but... <laughs> Thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, have me come and uh, talk. Basically, on the 23rd of uh, May, I sent a letter to all four members of the uh, committee just to kind of inform them of the, some of the current situations we have with the fire department. Uh, the first item on the letter uh, was regarding an opportunity to uh, receive some grant money from the Ohio Bureau of Workman's Compensation. Um, basically, it's for a power cot and loading system for one of our ambulances. Now, this is a pricey piece of equipment, um, but they offer basically a three to one matching grant. Um, when I wrote the letter, we were trying to get this thing done uh, before May. I'm sorry, I didn't put the actual time needed when we need to have the response, but that has since passed and we're, we're in this fiscal year. And all that means is we can only apply for this once every three fiscal years. So in order to update the fleet, um, it would take us a while to do that. Um, we are investigating some other opportunities that will work within BWC to potentially be able to outfit two. So uh, if you guys aren't familiar, we actually run two full-time paramedic units. Then we have one that sits in reserve for mechanical breakdown, so on and so forth. 
Um, so that, that was one item. And, and being that we're in fiscal emergency, um, there's no real clear delineation of how we harness that opportunity. How do we... Like matching funds, you mean? Correct. You know, the, the uh, FRP is pretty much bare bones. This is our projected expenses, and there's no money is really set aside for additional planning mm -hmm. you know and, and unfortunately that kind of comes with a lot of the stuff in here that i i would hope you know i know the state has mentioned it in previously in fiscal commission meetings they had mentioned they'd have a uh, capital improvement budget mm -hmm. by first quarter but that obviously has fallen past that timeline and i imagine they're still working on it it's you know it's a it's a moving target but it's important um, it's important when you start looking at not just the fire department you talk about the expenditures for a backhoe or the police department vehicles and it's it's a definite um definite need for the city to have an active capital improvement budget with a with a planning and justification process for that can i ask a point of clarity yes ma'am is the next application year then 2021 or 2022 so it's actually they they're based on fiscal year okay um this was actually fiscal year to 2017 so this one that we will apply for if we can figure out the the matching portion of it would be fiscal year 2018 and that pretty much runs june 1 uh till till night june of our may 31st of uh, 19. So uh, one more question. Yes. Does it have to be city matching funds? There, there is a requirement of matching funds. Yeah. But does it have to come from the city? Is my question. Um, you know, the the issue that BWC has is someone with fiduciary responsibility has to sign off on it that funds okay. will be available. Okay. So um, typically, it's you know, not an issue if your city's not in fiscal emergency. Usually, it's a uh, or something we can plan for as well. So ideally, if it's something that uh, we can look at make uh, appropriate plans for look at the frp down the road and say we're going to uh, slot this for for this plan because really the the system is the standard of care um when you look at accidents with uh, vehicles and patient care is number one and we need to be able to secure our patients as as uh, as well as possible right now we're in about the middle of the road standard okay uh, in the safety safety arena thank you yeah. that's helpful um, the second item uh, was really just an update to you guys regarding the, the department fleet repairs. Um, you know, we're almost halfway through the year, and we've pretty much spent half of our repair budgets. Now, knock on wood, we've been pretty good over the past few months with stuff since we got the most of the major repairs done. Um, and, and we actually had a, uh, a portion of our appropriations request that was unfunded at the beginning of the year, came in funded. And we're actually going to stash that in reserve for emergency use for our, our repairs just because we know what happens. End of the year, everything gets tight. Last year, I had to come before the previous finance committee and say, I need $40,000 to get stuff on track and up mm -hmm. and uh and they were very gracious and we were able to do those repairs quite quickly which was helpful but we have an aging fleet i mean your, your ladder the only ladder truck the city has is 22 years old mm -hmm. the engine company is our primary engine company is 18 years old and our newest engine company is nine years old and then our reserve, which we put into play a fair amount because of maintenance or downtime with the aging fleet, is uh, a 1990. So it's almost 30 years old. Can you say that phrase again? How do you refer to the vehicles? Uh, so ladder company, aerial truck has the, the large ladder and has all the ground. You call each vehicle a company? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, engine company, ladder company. Okay, thank you. I just went, I sure. thought you were talking about your service providers no. for repair. I was like, nope. okay, let me make sure. Yes, yes ma'am, sorry. All right, that's good. That's uh, fire department lingo, I guess. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so fleet's aging. And, and we have provided every year since 2003 a replacement schedule but unfortunately not having an active capital improvement budget it's really been something that has not been planned for and so um those the, the ladder truck is is a is a large capital expense now ladder trucks should be replaced every 20 years you know we're we're, we're thinking and and even if you said 
watch you go buy a new ladder truck, you're looking at a year down the road before the purchase is completed, the specs are done, and the, the vehicle is manufactured. It's a long time. That's typical? That's typical for an aerial truck. Engine companies, we can probably get specs and builds done nine months um, because we don't we aren't very fancy with our equipment. Um, we try to keep it bare bones and, and service providing so it's ready to go. But those those items are expensive. Um, the, the problem we're having, I think, from a, a replacement standpoint is we're going to have replacements backed up. Like the, the primary engine company should have been replaced three years ago. Mm. Average lifespan of a engine company is 15 years. Um, you know, in reserve status, it's a little different because it's not day-to-day -day use. So we can utilize a, those trucks, but our current reserve truck is an open cab. It doesn't even meet the safety standards, having uh, basically a single point harness seat belt and an open cab. So if we get an accident, it's, it's an issue, but it's what we have. And we do the best to maintain those. And the fact that we have a almost 30 year old fire truck that's still operational, it's pretty good. But we're seeing the pump capacity drop on it. It's not up to its previous uh, certification. It's more of a, an informational, hey, let's talk about it. What, what can we do to start planning for these things? Um, I think the communication from not just our department, every department is really incumbent to you guys so you can make um, down the road plans. We have these expenses. Um, this is probably the next one's the most important part for us. Um, it's protective gear. It's the, it's the gear that guys wear um, outside of their, their air mask. It's their protective stuff, the helmet, boots, coats, and trousers. We have uh, come to the previous finance committee you know, begging for money for this. Um, I have I've personally sat before probably three different finance committees explaining the, the defined need of uh, replacement schedule of this, of this gear. Now, the city's been very fortunate. The fire department's been very proactive in getting grant money to replace a lot of it and actually kind of hurt the department because we had a plan in place. Uh, finance committee had agreed to fund it. That same year, we got a huge grant. We were able to replace a large number of gear. Well, that appropriations never made it back into an annual planning budget. So it kind of just got left off. So um, I've got... 10 sets right now that have been condemned and have guys in reserve gear that's suitable, it's functional, but it's not to the standard of what we wear. It's great for what we bought it for. Um, however, now I have very few sets. If I've got a guy, uh, I say a crew gets exposed to something nasty in a, uh, in a fire and we have to send their gear out for professional cleaning, something we can't clean, I really don't have a lot to outfit these guys with. Kind of hodgepodge. Um, luckily, our, our provider is able to give us um, rental gear. So we have a large scale issue. It's a cost factor that we don't have anything built in either. Um, for emergency use, primarily we hire new people. They actually outfit our guy, outfit our new hires with loaner gear. They don't charge us a dime for it mm. until we're able to, to purchase their stuff. It comes in, turnout gear, the protective gear. Usually has a turnaround time of about 60 days from order to delivery. So it's nothing crazy, but it, it does take time because it's custom made per your measurement. So we were order you a set of gear. They would come down, measure your sleeve length, chest, well, everything, and it's custom made to fit you. Um, we got a number of sets that are going to outlive their their lifespan. Last year we, we had to condemn a couple sets because the cost factor to rep to repair them outweighed their value. Uh, we use we use a, a sliding scale generator that says a gear, set of gear lasts ten years. This repair costs X dollars. Well, that's outside of the appropriate repair for that. Uh, trying to be responsible with tax taxpayer money, you can't really. Th do a $750 repair on an eight-year-old pair of pants that's gonna get replaced in a year or two. So last year and this year, we, we had put in requests for $50,000 uh, for gear. Uh, 
those both those requests were unfunded. Uh, Mr. Bonsall was at the last finance committee meeting of 2017 where the city had appropriated us the additional monies to repair the uh, apparatus. I, I brought this subject to the table again and um, they said they'd take it under advisement, we can do it, and we just didn't hear anything. So I'm concerned. This is this is a concern. We can't have guys at work if they don't have gear. And that becomes a problem. If I don't have stuff to put guys in, to put them on the street to do their jobs, what, what are we supposed to do with them? Um, we are beginning, and, and we we actually inspect our gear. We self repair some of our gear, which not a lot of departments do. Um, but we've we've made the investment, have trained guys able to do some of the uh, standard repairs. Uh, there are certain portions of the protective system that we can't touch legally. It's a liability issue, so we have to send those to the manufacturer. But the outer shell material we can repair. Uh, the the all the rivets we, we can do in house, and we've made the uh, the. We have currently have two people that can do those repairs right now. We're going to send some additional people to get that training. So that'll help us, and it really helps us in the fact that when we have stuff go through inspections, which are required annually, if they come up with minor repairs, we can do those in-house and get that gear turned and back out on the street. Unfortunately, a large portion of our gear is reaching its termination or end of life, and we're going to be in a bad way. That number really is what I put in the letter. We really need 50,000 this year, 50,000 next year, and then what was presented to finance a few years ago was an annual replacement program. Because realistically, we should be providing our members with a backup set. So if uh, I go catch a fire at 8 a.m. and I start my shift and get covered in you know, combustion byproducts, I can actually get out of that gear, get it washed, and get into a second set. So I'm not exposing myself to those those items. Uh, I'm, firefighter cancer is a big thing. The Bureau of Workman's Compensation is spending a lot of money to help alleviate that. We're, tr we're trying, and that's a no match grant that we're trying to get some additional funding for to in improve our ability to clean our gear um, in, a, in a more rapid fashion. Right now we have one. We have one extractor that we can wash. It's not like we can just put our gear in a uh, regular washer and dryer. We have to utilize specific equipment to to, uh, to get it clean. But uh, you know, it comes down to another issue: how, how do we plan annually for these purchases? I, I think I know the fire chief had requested it in his his first budget request to uh, to the city this year. It was uh, done last year, and it just it comes back unfunded. And we're going to run into an issue, and I, I don't want it to become a um, a bulletproof vest issue. You know, I, I want to say, hey, we have this need. How how can we work through the FRP, the appropriations, and find a, a amenable solution to to replace some of this stuff? Um, the other thing that I, I brought up in here is more of a, an issue with uh, maintenance of the fire station. You know, our budget doesn't include buildings and grounds. That's a separate key held in the safety service director, I guess, is ultimately responsible for the buildings within. <clears throat> we've advised him that we've had uh, multiple leaks uh, in our roof system at the firehouse. The firehouse is 44 years old. And the average lifespan of firehouses is 50, give or take, 50 years. But our firehouse is very serviceable. It, it will certainly continue to do the job for a number of years. However, maintenance on that fire station probably needs to, to be uh, looked at from a more aggressive standpoint, I guess is the best way to put it. That roof system has leaked for a long time. The first documented request for repairs went out in 2005. And I have a stack of requests that have been made since then. Now, not since I became the assistant chief. Uh, I know safety service director Gears is aware of it. Um, but it comes down to where does that money come? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've asked for um, 
contractors to provide us with estimates um, waiting to get some of those back uh, so we can at least have three that's, that's gonna be a pricey number uh, the other issue is and we put in a wreck with this for uh, the buildings and grounds we've had some concrete issues in front of the fire station um, that need addressing it's a, a safety issue and I believe that to be a, a small ticket item um, but it's something that's been ongoing and we just don't have a, a, a way to kind of communicate those needs and have have a justification process set for us. So we say, hey, these are, we do, we have lots of wants. You know, we're not, we, we won't bring those to the table until we get clear of the, the recovery and, and have a, a good set path for firm financial uh, foundation. These are needs, these are definitive needs. And, and the, the roof is something that needs to be looked at and probably addressed relatively quickly because as it continues to leak, those problems just mount. That's pretty much it. Is there any questions that I could answer? I have a couple. These are pure curiosity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one, thank you for writing and making time to um, paraphrase. I, I, I think I'm just going to speak for myself. Y'all can speak up if y'all want to. I think the need is clear, what you're presenting. I think um, um, it's sad to, to hear for that length of time there's not been an, an opportunity. Um, I'm, I know that the ongoing response of we need more money is probably uh, cumbersome, but it, it is our reality. And so I know that you've been diligent to look for grants. I'm wondering with the organizations that provide those type of funding opportunities for fire departments, do they also provide any guidance, feedback, thoughts on even adjusting your own budget and how to maybe make some of those things part of your own plans? I'm just not sure what kind of support you all have when you're allocating sure. your own funds. So I would say that the majority of our budget is constrained through the collective bargaining agreement. So that it describes how and where you spend the money? No, I think it's just it. the collective bargaining agreement pretty much tells the city this is the amount that you need to appropriate because it's a contractual legal document and they um, they have to they have to so very little money to the fire department is outside of personal services right uh, so uh, when you're talking about the budget for improvements mm -hmm. how how do you all internally manage that that's what I'm trying to get better understand <laughs> sure um, I, I don't know that there is a universally adopted budgeting system here in the city. I, I think if the city would adopt a standard response or standard budgeting system that was um, utilized by every department within the city, including planning justification mm -hmm. uh, for those expenses, that would go a long way. I think having uh, an open communication between all departments um, certainly helps. It, sometimes it comes down to competing for the, that last dollar, unfortunately. And I don't know that we have a sound way of judging the priorities of how money's spent in this town sometimes. So uh, I'm, I appreciate that. Sure. I definitely took note of your um, suggestion around an active capital improvement budget, a plan for justification, a process. When you think about the, excuse me, the non-personnel dollars, do you all in, within the department have a way of going, okay, if we could X, Y, and Z, we might get closer to this repair. If we, Is that a process you're already working where we can maybe glean some insights from, or is it? Um, I, th I think typically, and this is my own opinion, so I don't know this to be fact, mm -hmm. but I think typically what has been utilized is budget in this town are looked at as more so as historical spending patterns. Hmm. This is how much we've spent, this is kind of what we need. Um, I, I think that the current chief has tried to be more proactive in, in a planning format and trying to get additional funds. I mean, putting the putting the appropriations request in for the turnout gear, which ultimately wasn't funded, I think that's 
probably what he thought is how, how we're supposed to do it um, when, when we're not given. And, and I know I, I'm not privy to the conversations the, the uh, state had when they were trying to assist the department heads with their budgetary planning purposes. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sure they were very helpful in, in regards to that. I, I know they were very pleased with what the fire chief provided them um, in the format that it was done. But uh, yeah, it, it would be nice if we had a universal budgeting uh, system here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, I, you know, I'd like to actually kind of be a little bit frank here, if we sure. can. I mean, in, in both sides. I mean, it's. Uh, I think there's a lot of conversations that haven't happened in the past, and we've got to figure. We've we've got to figure out. I mean, the ladder truck. That's got, what a million dollar expense when that comes up. Pretty much, yeah. You're, you're looking at a million dollars for a, a one truck you're going to use for 20 years. Now, extrapolate that over the service life. It's really not bad. But it's an expensive piece. Sure. It's. Uh, I mean, yeah. And, and those are like when I hear these things and see that we have, you know, the 18 year old engine company, um, you know, 30 serve apparatus. I mean, it's. It's kind of, it's not, I, well, I wouldn't say the word is shocking, but it's surprising that we're at this point with a department that is, I mean, frankly, when I talk to firefighters across, you know, from other areas is regarded as one of the ideal fire departments in, they, I've even heard a St. Bernard firefighter say, that's one of the best fire departments in the entire state is what I've, is what I've heard. But we're one of the best fire departments, but we can't afford to, you know, I guess give give the gear that we need to get to those to those firefighters and the equipment that they need. And so, I mean, there's, to me, it just seems like we've got there there's a disconnect here that you know we're spending seven to eight million dollars a year on our fire department, but we can't afford to get the you all the equipment that you all need. And I personally. I feel almost guilty at this point because, you know, how do we get those funds to where they need to be gotten to? And so um, you mentioned that we have the collective bargaining agreements and that those dictate, you know, those some of these, a lot of the language in there has been in there for decades, I'm sure. I mean, I've, I haven't gone back and looked at 1960 fire contracts, but I would, I bet if we went and looked at it, I bet we'd find at least, you know, sections that were very similar to what they are now and so you know all that being said uh we're all we all are um i guess you know nego you know navigating under the the standards that the ohio revised code is set for us when we talk you know when we deal with things but you know i would like i mean i really would like to see you know how do we, and I know that there's negotiations happening behind the scenes, there's something happening tomorrow, and I know that you're, you as a member, the assistant fire chief, you know, in Norwood, you're a member of the union. Yes, sir. Um, you know, it's, so, but I would, I, so basically, I mean, are there idea of ideas for how we can, I mean, how do we have a seven or eight million dollar fire department and we don't have, the, like, I guess I'm just saying, what can we do with the budget, like with your off budget, and sure. get us to, because I want to fund it. I mean, <clears throat> so I, I would say some of the numbers, like I think the, for the FRP this year, the the number is 6.9. Okay. That's personal services um, and everything else. Now it doesn't include fire fire administration. That's uh, that's a little different. Um, and so the, the the numbers that you see, you know, a lot of that was past due money. So last year was a pretty expensive year for the fire department when you look at it on a face value page. But then you, you start looking at the additional monies that were owed to the police and fire pension fund and that were paid in one year. And uh, the self-elected payouts of comp time to members. So those numbers don't really reflect true cost. And so I, I think really you have to base the cost of the service with the needs and wants of the residents, the expectations and the mandates that are on the books here for what the fire department does provide. I mean, you, you talk about 60 years ago, this fire department made EMS runs and fire runs, and that's it. The, the, the demand for service is ever increasing. The, the amount of things the fire department offers is 
wide ranging. We're, we're the catch all. If someone has an emergency that the police can't solve and they call the fire department. So, which we're happy to take, you know, and, and we, we want to be looked at as a valued service within this community. Um, and there, there are some definitive costs to that. Speaking from, a, 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 I guess, a, a broader range, I, I think that you have to look at everything top to bottom and say, what are the priorities of the city? Where do where we want to spend our money? Um, what do the residents demand and what should we provide them? As, as an assistant fire chief, I can tell you that I'm pretty certain they're going to want great fire department protection with great equipment and, and we do the best we can with the confines that we're given um, it, it's it's a tough tough thing and I, I don't think there's an instant fix I think this is going to take a, a lot of communication a lot of inner workings with with planning I think that um, an open line of communication between the, 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 I guess, the power brokers, the people that make the, the ultimate decisions with the, the, the fire administration um, who can help educate as to why, why we need these or why we do this, what's the, what's the basis for these, would go a long way. Uh, I, w I would say you probably aren't, and most people aren't aware of everything that the fire department does on a daily basis or, or what the services we provide to the community. Um, and, and really that's partly my job is to help educate the public, um, educate you all, the members that, that make the decisions and, and provide you with as much information as I possibly can. Um, this kind of thing will probably come to you on a regular basis more of a hopefully more of an informational purpose hey this is where we're at this is what we're doing we're trying to, to, to make some adjustments and it's one of the self adjustments is we took that that final appropriation for maintenance and we're holding it till the end to make sure we're gonna we're gonna make oh, I think we're gonna be okay but you just never know but we have to we're gonna we're gonna squirrel that one away to make sure we've got some reserve funds you know everything we have is just bare bones right now so we're, we kind of self-adjust as we can it's a difficult position to be in yeah um, I'm wondering can you provide us with a list of services absolutely I, I'd be happy to I, I'm very curious one to see it but then also to get more input I agree with you most residents would say yep we want that sure. but none of us are growing money absolutely and so I would love to see an opportunity for us to kind of survey sure. I don't know if maybe we could work with the paper to do that or just put it online but if we know we have to give something to get something um, I think it would be helpful to really know for certain and I think we could all guess what we value what our neighbors are saying sure. but um, I'd like to ask if you could provide us with a, a list of the services that are offered sure. um, I think pleasure. it would help keep the request in context but also help us evaluate you know there's a number of funds right now that have nothing in them yep and I'm very, very familiar with the FRP and uh, have, have really watched it with a, a keen eye. And uh, it, it's a difficult position to be put in. And, and you're kind of working backwards trying to get forwards. Mm -hmm. That's tough. That's tough. Um, you know, I, I, for me, it's, I'm a little frustrated at the, the speed of government. Um, I, I like things moving. I understand. You know, it takes time for things to, not specifically talking about the FRP, but just the way government operates. Yeah, I would, I would think that in 2018 we could move at a at a more nimble speed and that doesn't seem to happen but yeah i'll be happy to provide you with that um thank you and you can email me any questions regarding department operations I, you know my phone is always available and I, I always return phone calls so i'd be happy to do that so your timing <laughs> It's some, yeah, and, I mean, you know, you can hear, so I mean, for people at home can probably hear the noise, but I mean, it's pretty deafening in here when the ACs come on. I mean, I don't know what era this system is from, but uh, this is not... It's uh, working. Don't it's, complain. Uh, oh, no, it's working. <laughs> But it's definitely not uh, what we're seeing installed in, you know, these the office buildings that go up. So you mentioned about education, and you said that 
it sounded to, to me that you think that part of the issue of, of not having the appropriations for some of these, or not having not having some of these things addressed, is that, and by the way, the police department thinks this exact same thing, because um, Sergeant Buchanan specifically said it on council floor sure. a couple of months ago, but that because we don't know enough about what the fire department is doing, that's, you know, it seemed to me that that might you might think that that's the reason why you, there's not more funds that have been allocated for the non-personnel things. Uh, I just wanted to say, like, I just definitely wanted to, to say that uh, it, I mean, you could educate me and show. I mean, I've gone down and talked to Chief Wallace and went in the conference room with him, and he just explained. He showed me every truck at one point and what each man does, and you know, and I pre. And, and by the way, I appreciate the expertise and. I will say, our fi I know that you all down there, for the little resources that you all have for the non-personnel stuff, I know that you all maximize it. I mean, I know that you all work hard to find ways to, to push it through. Uh, I know, I mean, just speaking for myself, I know I appreciate it immensely, and I'm sure the rest of the council does as well. Uh, but I don't know how we're going to get... I, I mean, just looking at the financial recovery plan, looking at the state of our parks, looking at the state of our streets, looking at... I mean, even the city hall, there's so much deferred maintenance here that we've got to address, too. Uh, Absolutely. We, we definitely need to get, I mean, that roof. I mean, the roof needs to be, something needs to be done there. I, Because if you don't address that, then it's just going to exas exacerbate. But there's so many needs that we have. And this is what I would, you know, when Sergeant Buchanan came as well, I would say the same thing to him is that the amount that gets appropriated does not indicate the value that I think us or our residents, like, place on you, on you all. It's... There are, there are so many needs in the city, and frankly, I mean, this. I keep talking about how easy this job is in for council in the sense that we have no money to give. So it's basically been an answer that you know it, we don't have to think all that hard on it because it's like where are we going to get the funds from? Correct. And so you know, I envy. I've got friends that are on council in Blue Ash, and I kind of envy them. I'm like they're actually having a lot of fun with trying to do big things for their city and really push their city forward. And so. I'm just, I, I don't see where, I mean, you know, at this point, to if when, if this if this ladder truck tomorrow were to just fizzle out or whatever, you know, and we had to find the money to get that thing fixed, or we had to find the money to replace it, uh, I mean, I don't know what happens next in the sense that, I mean, the city has been pretty bare cut when it comes to personnel, the, non, the non-police and fire departments, when it comes to personnel, when it comes to... Uh, their materials and supplies and stuff. I mean, we've we have cut almost as much as I mean we can comfortably cut. I mean, there's I'm sure there's always small things you can find, but that's not going to add up to a lot. And so the question that like you know I have I think about and the thing that really I, I have a hard time sleeping at night sometimes when I'm thinking about this is like what comes next. I mean, are we do we close the health department next? I mean, do we close our senior center? Do we close the waterworks pool? I mean, I don't know what comes next when and we have to address these, some of these things i mean like when that ladder truck comes up we have to, we're going to have to take action i mean the city we're we're not going to have a choice and frankly we almost need to take action now because if it's going to take a year to get it and so the, the challenge i would just put to to both i mean i would say both of our public sector unions is that we've got to figure out we've got to work out a plan together we've got to be we've got to work better together in the sense of figuring out what we can do to to right size the budget. I'm just because at this point, and one of the things about our contract, and I mean, you know, you all know this, you know this, but we have a thing called a table of organization in the police and fire contracts. And in this thing, we have a specific number of like just uh, overall general like firefighters, you know, of apparatus, I think operators, lieutenants, you know, captains, the assistant chief and the chief, it's all stated right there in the contract. And so when the city of Nord goes into bad times, we lit we cannot, even through attrition, we cannot reduce that number. Although right now we, I mean, frankly, we haven't uh, hired to it, but you know, it's not supposed to be under that number. And so, um, it gets to the point that we have to then cut other things in the city in order to maintain that that level. Uh, and so, you know, if it, if we do f have another economic downturn, I mean, I just don't know what's going to get cut next. And frankly, even just to get work on some of our parks and work on the streets, I just don't know. And so, these are the other kind of things that like keep me up at night. And I know that. Uh, my wife gets on me all the time because I'm always working on city, I'm working on city stuff at night, and she's like, "James, just put it down, and come to bed." But we really have got to figure out some way to systematically 
and you know, well not permanently, but really have a paradigm shift and figure out how we can move this city forward. Because we need, I mean, frankly, you all don't have like the computers in your cabs, in the in your equipment that yeah. allows you all to, uh, you know, see like the dispatches that you have or what what else you need to work on. I mean, or even see like where the fire hydrants are. And that is correct. We're the only fire department inside the county that doesn't have mobile data terminals. Gotcha. I, I knew that you were one of the only, but I did not know that. So that's, I mean, that, that's another thing that I was like, I would like my firefighters to have that kind of technology so that they can know where these fire hydrants are and they can know where uh, they can see the other dispatch runs that are, you know, that need to be addressed and just like the police department has. And so uh, it's just... There's no way we could, I mean, there's just no way we could provide that. And I know you all have not asked for that. So, like, I'm not pushing that on you. I'm just saying, just when I talk to friends that are firefighters, that uh, I hear about this, so I was like, oh, my gosh, that sounds amazing, you know? And I know that you all would probably love to have that. So, I don't know how this, it's not a conversation we're going to solve tonight. Absolutely not. And, and, but it's just something that we have, I mean, as a city, we've got to figure it out. And, like, I know I've, you know, yeah, it, it yeah. And so, um you know, feel free. I mean, definitely make any comments that you want to make about that. But uh, I, I know you mentioned blue ash. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand blue ash is not a statutory city like Norwood is. Norwood's confined to the ORC. Blue ash is a charter city, so they've got specific voter implemented regulations that kind of make their decisions a little easier. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. yeah. What, what kind of, do you know what kind of regulation? Well, they, they've got a salary structure in their charter. It says they can't spend over set dollars on, on salaries. And they have a set number that goes to recreation because they're a charter city. It was, it was done many years ago. Oh, so they actually have in their charter, they have a set percentage that they, that they dedicate to recreation. So Correct. You can all say that Blue Ashes Parks are pretty phenomenal. So that's fascinating. Uh, do they have a well anyway so that so that so you're saying because of the charter they can do things like that there, there are certain the voters can do that. implementations done by the voters who wanted the charter uh, that are done uh, you know you're talking about a very engaged community in blue ash um, I, I think you've got it's it's a much larger community than the Norwood and, and talk about your your square miles it's less dense population um, do you have any firefighters blue ash house by chance I I'd have to call their union president I'm not sure I, I want to say that they have now when you, when you start talking about county fire departments it's a, it's a lot different ball game you know they they have agreements within you know I know for for a fact blue ash is part of what's called the Northeast fire collaborative and it's a number of cities that, that basically operate together but they're separate entities mm -hmm. <clears throat> That really doesn't work for Norwood since we're surrounded by the city of Cincinnati. That's interesting. That's how they're able to supplement. Because I think they have, when I looked at their annual report for like 2015, I think it was like somewhere in the upper 30s or lower 40s or something. But that sounds. But they are make that happen through this collaborative. That they're. Par, I mean, it's partial, partial way to do it. I mean, you know, each fire department is kind of a. When you start looking at fire departments out in the county very rarely can you find a mirror image of one to another yeah um so and and really it's hard to find um when you look at fire departments you really need to look at what is that community that they're serving made of what's the socioeconomic status what's the population density what's the housing stock what's the housing density what's the number of runs they're making you look at norwood we're pretty much pick up our station put it at station 32 on forest right near the zoo in cincinnati that that's the number of runs that station makes and you know they're ultimately supplemented by three additional stations within their their fire department and we're we're operating with just us so it's um you, you know people like to talk about comparables and rarely do you find a community that's comparable to norwood one of the oldest housing stocks in the nation uh, i don't think you'll find many communities that even come close to the population density nor housing density here uh, there's only one other city in the state of Ohio surrounded by another city, and that's Bexley and Columbus. You know, their their I guess average number of wage is seventy thousand dollars a year, where Norwood's is closer to twenty eight. 
So it's a, it's a tough dynamic when you start measuring those things, when you start looking at how a fire department fire department operates. You know, what's what's the run volume? What are they seeing in runs? You know, do they do they have a large opiate issue? That's that's been just troublesome for many county departments, especially in Hamilton County. And it's all over Ohio. I and mean, let's be frank, it's very few are immune from that. You know, obviously some of the more well to do communities don't see it as often. Norwood sees a fair amount just because the, the highways that travel through here. We're a central community. We we see seventy one, five sixty two go right through our town. And so it's an easy way. You know, we would see it. The the heroin crisis would hit. It would hit in Covington, and a day later it'd be downtown Cincinnati, and the next day it'd be in Norwood. And it's been tough, but yeah, I mean, it. I don't know that there's one magic answer. I, I think. I, I think it's really. It's a difficult position. You guys are part time council people, right? You're not full time like some of the other places. Um, you're doing the best you can and with the support of the state it's helpful but how do you take a part-time global look at the city and say what are we doing wrong what are we doing right how do we mesh those to make it all right you know what's your revenue stream you know norwood's primary measure of income which is probably most other places is that is a earn, earnings tax and most of that is generated from people outside of the city of norwood if you, if you look at the numbers um, i think the citizens here get a great product for what they pay for here it's it's when you look at it comparatively it's it's uh you'd be shocked i think uh a lot of people don't understand that the the property taxes here where they go it's it's a, it's a hard trouble. It's a hard issue, right? You know, you've got a person who is spending a lot of their money f to pay their property taxes, and where, where does that go? It goes out in the county, goes to the school system, it goes to the MRDD levies. You know, all important things, but a very small portion goes to the city, and that's difficult. And then and then what do you say? We're going to raise revenue. How are we going to raise revenue in this town? Are we going to say we're not going to have reciprocity on income tax? So that the Norwood resident that pays 2% to Cincinnati is now going to come back and pay 2% to Norwood as well. That's that's a tough pill to swallow, yeah, like that. right? And you, you'd say, well, we need to raise, we need to have an issue to, to raise earnings taxes or we need to raise property taxes. And you say, well, we're, we're getting taxed out of our mind by these, these other issues. So you're in a difficult position. Um, Making arbitrary decisions just based on money is difficult, and you, you would you would really I don't know how else you do it. I mean, I, I don't know that any study has been completed by looking at any of the departments in this town. What is what is this department? What's Department A offering? What should they be offering? What's the expenses of that? Is that in line with what they're doing? Is that appropriate for the city? You know, I, I take issue sometimes with the developments. You know, they're great, they're needed, we need those things, but are we doing impact studies? When Paycor is gonna build a, a beautiful new building, 150,000 square feet, they're gonna add another thousand employees. What, how is that gonna impact the city? What's it gonna do to the traffic count? What's it gonna do to police services, potentially fire services, public works? How, how does that, new flow of revenue really impact what we do as a service provider you know i don't know that's ever been done here and, and norwood's gone through a number of changes and I, i'd say they've done a really good job of diversifying their economy here we're not a strictly manufacturing town anymore we really are lucky that we've got somewhat of a recession proof economy within the medical community we have you know people get sick the economy goes up and down the medical services those don't change that's per, that's pretty solid and recession proof paycor that might take a hit in a recession I, you know i don't know i'm not an economist but you're in a tough spot and, and I, I don't envy you because you've got a number of decisions to make and and how do you make your best educated decision doing that going forward i i would think the city would would be able to, to help you with those decisions by providing some studies and looking at key services. <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your comments there, and that's helpful to hear. And I, I mean, many times that we don't say what's on our mind, and I feel like that it does a disservice to really just having an open communication. So I just want to encourage you to to continue to you know engage with us and let us know what you're thinking, and I'll continue to do the same. Sure. Uh, and so. You know, and just I just want to reiterate to your membership that the value, you know, the the amount of appropriations that goes to any one department or any one need or whatever, it has nothing to do with the value that we see in you all. And I know, like I said, I know that you all work hard. I know that you all have a high level of professionalism, and you hold your members to high standards as well. And so um, it's appreciated because I don't think that happens everywhere. Uh, so. I guess when you all have only one firehouse, I mean, you can't just ha you can't just send a man over to somewhere else. I mean, you got to deal with them right then if there's an issue, and so, uh, or you're going to be dealing with them for the you know, next 20 years mm -hmm. if you keep ignoring it. So, <laughs> uh, I won't go into that. But um, <laughs> so, anyways, um, is there any other comments or questions that we have for that specific? Right. And before, and I'll just say, if you all have, I'll say something else, but I want to make sure I open it up to you all. Okay. So, just yeah, yeah just you. looking at I mean, for just my thinking here, looking at the request. Um, You're looking back at the letter. Yeah, the letter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do we have the for the public the BWC? I mean, is there any funds anywhere in your department that can absorb that? At least just getting one of the cops. Um, I, I know the fire chief has been looking. I, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we don't have a bunch of free money sitting, you know, you know, obviously we're, we've yeah. got the, the same issue. So, um, yeah, it, being that it's now that we're in this time frame, it, it may be something we say, Hey, we revisit that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's a, I think it's a, a worthy cause. And I think we should definitely go after something like that specifically for the safety features for the residents that will be utilizing that. Um, but also for our members, I mean, it, it, it's a def BWC has been doing this grant for this specific thing for a long time because it virtually eliminates back injuries <laughs> for firefighters and paramedics. Um, maybe that's something we, we're going to say, hey, this is we're going to put this on. We're going to we're going to eyeball the FRP and say we get to December and say we've got money. There's still money available. As I know, last year there was a lot of shifting of monies within the FRP. Granted, the end number said we can spend this. The end number was pretty much where we thought we were going to spend it, but there were keys that were up eight percent and keys that were down ten percent. And, and at the end of the year, we might be able to look at it and say well, we've got this unexpended amount within. Now the problem comes when you say that is we've received our POs already, so getting a PO change sometimes this speaks to my speed of government. I think it, it's it's. It's hard because now I've got to refill out a request. It's got to go to the safety service director, then it goes down to the auditor. And you know, in the day of electronic business, I, we're still pushing paper. So you're naming the actual process of changing a PO that would free up some money might be but, a barrier. Well, it, I don't think it's a barrier. It's just a, a t time constraint. Okay. So we're, if we're talking, we're going to look at doing this maybe at the end of the year, and we'll say, all right, we're, the fire department's going to look at what we have in expenditures or in our POs that are still available. Yeah, it's a potential. I I don't know how much we'll find, um, and then then we have to amalgamate those all those POs into a single one and get it done. Um, I, I think the, the biggest struggle for us is that the, the requirement of BWC to have someone with fiduciary responsibility saying, yes, we, we will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And getting that, because that just elongates the process because we have to have that done before they even entertain the grant application. So, you know, it's a difficult, it's one of the difficult portions of being in fiscal emergency, but Okay, we know we're in fiscal emergency. So how do we work around this? Yeah. How how can we manage this portion of it? Because by and large, everything's skin and bones, and, and we're doing the best we can. So. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Uh, is there any other comments or qu things that we want to talk about before we adjourn? Okay. 
I would like to say one more thing yeah. I, I, in, in response to um, you know dealing with the the collective bargaining agreements I, I think it would go a long way to have a, a joint labor management committee where, where the, the those people sat down and, and talked because realistically the way collective bargaining is supposed to work is that we know that item a is the city's best interest in labor and management work together to find a way to get there but that hasn't happened what we have is a you know we're always a uh, opposite polar ends and there's there's no discussion so having a, a a joint labor management committee that that operates and a lot of times that's primarily done within the fire department and the fire chief however the way the city operates it would probably be well to have and you're not negotiating so don't take this as you know we're, we're going to go out and we're going to do our collective bargaining agreement this way because really ideally it doesn't happen however if you talk about issues that you know may come may come up and you say well, how can we do this together because you got to build the trust the city and the union together ha should be working together, not, not at odds. And, and I think a, a good starting point of doing that is forming a joint labor management committee and, and then getting those people in the same room, even if it's just discussing what's going on, what, what are we doing that we can do better? And then working that relationship into a point where you've got, um, got that relationship where you can bring that and say, hey, this is where we're at. Because in years prior, when the city came to us and said, we've got troubles, we said, what can we do? And we would do that um, and save the city a lot of money. But that trust has been broken, you know? And that's, that's the tough part. And we should be able to say, I'm gonna shake your hand and we're good. And that's all it takes. But that's just, that's just my, my opinion, I think. I think it's, it's something to look into. That's all I got. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak on this. Um, I will email. Would you like me to email everyone that that list of department issue, the department uh, list of services? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd say to send right. it to the whole council too. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank appreciate you for it. your time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, at this point, we are going to adjourn. So. Thank, thank you. you both. Thank you. Thank you.